Welcome. Hello, welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's Talk Gardens, a weekly webinar series on gardening and related topics. We're so glad to have you here today. We have a very special day. We're broadcasting this from our greenhouse facility out in Suitland, Maryland. So it should be a special treat, but please, we pardon our noise that it might happen. This is a large facility and uh, people might drop in unexpectedly on gel and melanie. So my name is Cindy Brown. I'm Smithsonian Gardens Education and Collection and Access Manager. I have the great opportunity to introduce our presentations and to work with all these delightful uh, Smithsonian Garden staff. A bit of housekeeping. We will be answering the questions at the end of our presentation. So please put your questions in the chat box. In the chat box, it should be located on your screen at some point, and we'll be following that. And I will ask Melanie and Jill the questions at the end. Now we have quite a lot to share with you today. So if we run over, please do not worry because we post the questions and answers as well as the video with closed captions on at least about a week from now, it'll pop up on our website. So you'll be able to see more, including the videos that we're gonna show you. The videos will be shared on our social media as well as on our website. So when you're putting your questions into the chat box, please remember to have them open to everyone. If you have the answers or the questions open to everyone, everyone will be able to see. This is a setting that's on your computer, not on my computer as broadcaster. Also, please, if you have low quality uh, reception for the video or for the webinar today, please realize that you control that as well. Close all your browser windows so that you have the most optimal viewing conditions. I also like to say that if uh, you have any problems at all with how you're seeing us, that's also controlled by you. And you can have it as gallery view or as speaker view. So whichever way you prefer when you're watching a webinar. Okay, that was all the boring stuff. But let's go to the meat of it because this is an exciting program. So I would like to introduce two uh, horticultures that work both downtown interiors in the museums as well as our production. They've got enormous jobs and we're so glad that we could take time out to be with them today. So once I introduce them, I'm going to disappear and then Melanie is going to give me a sign to show me when to advance the slides. Uh, so you'll hear her direct to me, but pay attention to the video or to the slides. They're much more exciting. So today we have Melanie Pyle and Jill Gonzalez. Melanie and Jill, we're thrilled to have you here. Please tell us all about what we're seeing with exuberant containers. Hi, welcome. I'm Melanie and Jill is behind me and we are definitely social distancing and uh, protecting each other. So um, if it seems like we're less than six feet apart, we are not, we are definitely six feet apart. Um, welcome to our program. We are exuberant uh, growers and want to enlighten you to some of the um, fine art involved in containers. Um, and we're going to start my little Carol Burnett indication to Cindy. Um, I'm going to take you through a couple slides uh, showing you what some of the containers look like on the grounds of the Smithsonian Museums. Unfortunately, we are unable to be there um, because of everything that's going on, but I thought I would start out just giving you an idea of what we as horticulturists at the Smithsonian do with our containers. And then after that, I'll give you um, a little idea of uh, some pointers on how to do a container and then Jill will add to my presentation and then we'll show you a couple videos at the end, um, which are actually demonstrations on how to make your perfect container. So these two pictures that you see here are uh, groupings of containers that are horticulturists working for the Enid Haupt Garden place every summer in front of the um, south entrance to the castle. Uh, they have decided to put groupings of containers so 
um, public is able to see a variety of plants and um, shapes of containers and colors. Did you get that? Okay. <laughs> the next one is a grouping of containers that are placed at the entrance to the American History Museum. Um, they're quite large and usually sit on top of uh, the plinths on either side of the entrance, um, the south entrance of the museum. And again, a beautiful combination of plants in quite large containers, um, but a variety of plants all complementing each other and uh, very tastefully done. The next one is um, my area of specialty, which is the interiors of the museums. Um, these are also containers that the public are uh, able to see at the entrance of the museums. This one in particular is located at the entrance of the Ripley Center and is a combination of tropical plants, um, a large uh, philodendron surrounded by some dracaenas and caladiums. In one of our pieces that is um, part of the Smithsonian Gardens furniture collection. Um, a container is a general term used for anything that uh, contains a plant and um, the picture you see here now uh, are examples of containers that we have in the beds of the uh, Cogod Courtyard up at uh, National Portrait Gallery and American Art Museum. And um, they are containers within a large container. Uh, if you take the definition of container, um, literally the raised planter beds in there could be considered uh, containers as well. So these are containers within a very large container. And this one is even a farther stretch of interpreting the word container. Um, this is an artificial tree that we've chosen to use several times in some of our um, annual orchid exhibits. And it can be considered a container as well because of the artificial limbs have um, areas within them that contain plants. Uh, so we're able to give the public an idea of what an epiphytic or um, a plant that is not reliant on soil to grow, uh, what it would look like in um, real time. So uh, this is considered to be a container as well. Uh, some additional shots. Unfortunately, one is sideways, but um, maybe you can imagine what it looks like if it's the right direction. Um, these are a variety of containers that, again, are inside the museums. Um, another urn on your left-hand side uh, featuring a nice combination of, of tropicals. And then an orchid, which we placed on the desk at the American Indian Museum. And a uh, container down to not that one, the one to the right, is one that is all um, a variety of different varieties of peppers put together. You can use just about anything in a container. And uh, this is one that we placed in the castle. Um, and uh, it's what we call a dish garden. But in, again, it's a container or a grouping of plants within one pot. A couple more slides um, to give you some idea of how you can use containers. This is a grouping of containers that uh, I saw when I visited um, Huntington Gardens. Um, and it's uh, just a variety of individual plants, but they all go together in um, one grouping. And uh, it's just another way you can use containers. And again, another stretch of the word container. These are beautiful. Um, uh, bougainvillea plants growing within these sculptural pieces at the Getty Center in outside of Los Angeles. Again, it is a container. They are contained plants and um, just a different version that you normally would see. So um, the, ne the next group of slides you're going to see are um, include some tips on uh, how we are using containers now. I think um, a container uh, has changed in many ways in that the way people are using them now, um, a great idea to do with your containers is to incorporate them into your gardens when you're designing your gardens. Um, gardening has become one of the top hobbies for the public and 
um, it's always wonderful to try and use new items uh, to make it different. And one favorite thing I have is, this is actually a picture in my yard, <laughs> is um, using containers to uh, complement the existing plants you have and um, actually use up space. Uh, to fill something like this with annuals would be incredibly expensive. Um, and n not always are you successful with the annuals you put in the ground, but when you have something that's contained and um, you have a little bit more control over the growing conditions. Um, and it's a little bit more artistic and you add some different interest in, uh, in a garden. Here again is another shot of one. It's a little more subtle, um, but it, it does add to the, uh, to the composition and it's, it's just a nice touch that, that you can achieve um, without having to add additional plants. Um, again, another tip when you're deciding on um, what plants you might incorporate into a container, um, I would advise doing something that would complement um, the design of the container that you choose. Uh, I guess when you're figuring out what your container is going to look like, um, do you choose the plant first or do you choose the container first? If you choose the container first, then um, it's a great uh, idea to use a plant that would complement the container. And here it, in this shot that you see, um, there's a lot going on in the container. So the plant you use, um, it, it, in this case, it definitely complements the design. Uh, here again is another shot of um, a container that's complementing the plant. You can see the color is what ties the two together. The grayness of the container and the grayness of the kale that's used there, um, you bring the design up from one into the next or from one down to the container. Um, another thing to think about is when you uh, choose a container and then you put your um, composition in with your plants, try and draw that, the colors and the textures and the design down into the plants you have in the ground as well, because then everything flows together uh, the, the slide on the left, you can see the oranges go down into the orange around the base of the container. And on the right, the pink of the, of the um, coxcomb, you can see right in the center of the caladium, you've got some pink there too. So the colors are flowing down from one to the other and back up into the uh, plants in your container. Um, and then <laughs> this is a little trick that I love. Um, when you have a low container, you can get instant success with uh, your composition. If you just take a hanging basket that is already done for you, um, that you buy at a garden center, you can just take the hanging basket, put it directly in the container, and you have something that looks like it's been growing that way forever. And you can take full credit for what you have just <laughs> created. Um, okay, so uh, now we're just going to go through a few of the different um, materials that you can use for containers. Um, terracotta is probably the most popular um, material that people use for containers, and uh, it's good in many ways, um, but it's, it's a delicate product, um, very susceptible to breakage. Um, and you can see in some of those pieces down there that when um, that sometimes the minerals in the water will uh, transfer through the material and you'll get the soluble salts on the exterior of the container. Some people love it, some people don't. So that's just something you need to consider. If you want something that's a little bit more clean looking, this product uh, will do that and um, not look so clean. Uh, a way that people use terracotta plants, um, or pots rather, um, I thought this was a, a different way of displaying some containers. Uh, concrete um, is another wonderful product. It's very uh, heavy, unfortunately. Um, these are both pieces in my garden, and the elephant that you see there is something my uh, godmother gave me for my birthday once, and it requires two, if not three people to move, but uh, it's... Um, you can, with concrete, you can, there's a variety of styles um, that you can get and uh, you can experiment with some fun shapes and sizes too. So concrete's good for that reason. 
some people use metal, um, metal containers, I think uh, pose a problem for plants. They conduct heat uh, very easily and sometimes get a little bit too hot for the plants roots. Um, not always a great suggestion, but if you're in a cooler environment, um, it might be okay. Uh, and then wood, a wooden container is a great option as well. Um, this is actually one my husband built. Uh, it built it for a friend of mine, but um, uh, very easily constructed, uh, you know, depending on how you finish it, it, it can last for a long time, what kind of wood you use. Um, but that is another product that's available for containers. And I'm not quite sure what um, someone was trying to do here, but this is, you know, a natural way of displaying plants. It is container technically and uh, a good way, a, a different way of uh, growing vegetables, effective nonetheless. And uh, just a couple more fun ways of displaying plants. Um, uh, terracotta on the left and a, um, a finished terracotta product on the right. Um, just, you know, different designs and different ideas of um, what containers can be. And uh, this is one a slide that Cindy actually gave me. Um, and, you know, any container, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, is anything that can contain a plant. And uh, this, is, this is different different, but nonetheless, um, an effective growing spot. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jill. And after Jill's finished, we'll do the uh, videos. <laughs> All right, let me take this off. So my name is Jill Gonzalez. So I want to welcome everybody today. And just a little bit about what I do. I'm in charge of, uh, I'm the lead horticulturist in the production section. So I'm in charge of growing and, and scheduling and buying all the plugs and growing all the annuals um, and some perennials in the production set, uh, section that goes down to the garden. And, and I also am in charge of helping Melanie uh, with interiors by growing the poinsettias uh, for display in our holiday displays in December. So my, my turnover in my green houses is great. So I'm always constantly doing something different. Um, so um, one of my backgrounds uh, for years and years and years was in retail. And a lot of what I did was construct containers to be sold in retail. So over the years, I've, I've kind of developed some strategies um, that I think make for an interesting container. Uh, it used to be when I was just starting out, it would be all geraniums with a little bit of ink coming down the side. But over the years, I've decided that's not quite as interesting. And so you may see my technique is a little bit different, um, but it's everybody's to each their own. So whatever works for you. Um, but I'm just gonna give you some tips today on how um, my, my container designs have evolved over the years. Um, but this first slide is just uh, giving you a general idea. There's a lot of neat and good potting mixtures out there that you can buy. Um, you gotta be careful though, because there's some that we, you'll see at the, they're be gar called garden soil. And I think sometimes they're a little bit heavy. So what you want is a nice, light, well-drained soil. Um, some of the mixes have what we call a charge. They have some fertilizer built into them, which is kind of nice. It kind of gives it a little bit of a boost when you first plant your, um, your annuals or your perennials or whatever you're putting in your container. So that's a good thing. And then other, other, um, um, mediums will have what they call a wetting agent too. Um, good and bad. Um, I tend to like to not have that because I like to be able to control how much water I put on my container. So if you had a lot of rain or whatever and your container stays kind of wet because you have this wetting agent in there, it, it, it may be detrimental to the plant. But um, to each his own. If you're not going to be out watering a lot, it might be a good thing to have that added in. So look at the bag. Um, it should be a good well-drained potting mix. Um, for containers, uh, garden soil is too heavy. So you'll see some that are labeled garden soil and I would stay away from those. Uh, this is just a slide that just gives you an idea of, again, when Melanie was talking about the different types of containers. What's neat nowadays is um, it's amazing if you want something that looks like a terracotta, but you don't want the weight of a terracotta. Um, there's a lot of uh, materials out there, whether it's plastic or some other lightweight material 
And it's amazing. When you go to pick up the pot, it looks like it's a terracotta pot. When you go to pick it up, it almost flies out of your hands. It's so light. So there's a, those are wonderful ways um, to incorporate the look of whether it's a pot up that, you know, a glazed pottery or a terracotta that actually are actually more lightweight can be moved around a lot easier. So um, obviously those are, those are out there too. So I would definitely work on those. Some of them look really, really like the real thing. Um, whiskey barrels uh, used to be a big thing. Um, um, back, you can buy them. I don't know if you can even buy them now. It, it, I haven't seen them, but they do come in plastic. So if you want that look of a whiskey barrel, um, they're out there too. Uh, fertilizer, general fertilizers. Uh, you can go organic, you can go with slow release. There's all kinds out there. Um, some that you just put, uh, you know, the slow release, which is just like an Osmocote that will be released gradually. Uh, those, those types of fertilizers, you have to be careful because when it does get really hot, they tend to release very quickly, so it looks like you haven't really, really fertilized. So you have to keep an eye on that. Um, I use a lot of the organics um, just because I, I just like they, they're really good for the soil. Um, but you do need to use those periodically, especially if you're watering a lot, especially in the heat of the summer when you're watering that that, that container an awful lot, it will leach out of the soil much faster. So. Um, to each his own on the fertilizer, I tend to go with more organic. Some you can mix with water, some are just a granule as you would sprinkle around and incorporate into the soil. Um, you know, well-based um, fertilizer is good. It just, just go by the label um, and uh, use it frequently. Uh, like I said, you want it, it's gonna be leached out very quickly, uh, especially if you're watering a lot in these hot summer days. Um, so keep an eye on that. And of course, we always have to worry about the little pesky critters in the yard. Um, squirrels, I have uh, a nice groundhog that I named Chumley, who has, <laughs> likes to take uh, bites out of my tomatoes and, and eat the cucumber flowers. And so you always have to deal with uh, the critters and, and just deal with it. Sometimes it's a little frustrating, but um, you have that as a, you know, just when you think you have a great crop going on and something's out there eating it. But uh, we always have to worry about the critters too. And of course, we always have help in the garden, our wonderful furry friends. And uh, they're always out there to lend a hand and supervise. I have two supervisors at home that, that will help me when I'm in the garden. They're always obviously looking at what I'm doing and, and uh, lending a hand. So that's always a fun thing to have, have the family out there too. Videos. All right. Okay. So we're going to switch places again. Okay. Um, so thank you, Jill. Um, this video does not have any sound. Uh, the space that I um, recorded it in was a little too noisy, so I decided to do it with no sound and figured that I could walk you through it as we uh, proceed through the video. Um, and at this, I'm showing you, this is a very heavy container. Um, it's uh, 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 got a hole in it, which is not something that we like to use in the um, interiors. Uh, it is a container that was used in interiors, but for this uh, sake of um, the video, I'm going to uh, pretend that this is going to be used outside. So I have put some foam in the bottom of it. If you filled this very heavy container with soil from the bottom to top, it would be, uh, it would require two people to move it at once. Um, so I've decided to use foam to use up some of the space and then uh, fill it with a potting medium, like Jill mentioned, a very, um, porous medium. It's uh, a soilless mix, so it really doesn't have any soil in it. Um, it's made up with natural products, but it's not, uh, no um, soil in it. Uh, it's very loose. It's, as I said, porous and light um, and will allow the plant uh, adequate drainage and um, there's probably some fertilizer in it as well. Uh, I am at this point trying to get the container off of an anthurium. Um, it's quite root bound, so I'm going to use an X-Acto knife to cut the pot away from the roots of the plant 
Um, and when I finish, you'll see how indeed how uh, root bound it really is. Um, tropical plants are really hot on the market this year. Uh, most of the nurseries I've gone through are loaded with um, choices of tropical plants. But please keep in mind, if you use any of them, they are generally shade grown and will burn if you put them outside in full sun. So the container I'm putting together right now is something that you would put in a very shady location. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a healthy plant. Um, as I mentioned, you have a huge amount of tropicals you can choose from. Um, sold everywhere and uh, just make sure that um, the ones you do use you will not put in a sunny location. Um, I'm going to add to this container, uh, fill in a little bit of the soil. Um, oh and at this point also um, this plant is a little bit too big for the space that I put it in so I'm going to prune some of the lower leaves off to allow other plants to find a space below it and make this um, this container ha have a little bit more interest than just one individual plant. Although this plant could sit by itself, it's uh, you know a beauty on its own. I think it um, adding a couple different colors to it might make it a little bit more interesting um, composition. Uh, just a couple more leaves taken off and then fill in with soil around it. Um, the root ball of the plants that I'm going to be adding are much smaller than the one I just put in. So you're gonna to have to put some soil around the base of the roots of the anthurium to provide a, um, uh, a spot for these plants that are gonna go in um, to sit a little bit higher in the pot. Um, as I mentioned, their root balls are not as large. Uh, and this one is a philodendron. Um, philodendrons come in many colors now, uh, new varieties on the market every year. Um, this one has some reddish leaves and it's actually two plants in one. So I'm going to gently pull them apart um, and plant them individually because uh, if I planted it all at once, it would be too big and um, not look in proportion to the anthurium. So I just put one on either side, um, gently push them down. Um, well, actually not so gently, but with some force, but uh, keeping in mind that their roots are delicate and you don't want to uh, damage them by pushing them too hard. Um, again, filling back in with some soil um, and going, making sure that I go all the way around so there aren't any pockets of air. Um, and keeping in mind when you do do this to leave some space um, from the edge of, or from the lip of the container uh, to where the soil level, level comes because when you water them, you don't want the water to run right off. If the soil is above the lip of the container, your water will not soak in and will run off and will not get to where you want it to get to, which is the roots of the plant. Um, so now this is, this is nice, but I think I need a little bit more, something brighter. So um, I've decided to use uh, some variegated bromeliads. Again, bromeliads are uh, readily available at most nurseries. Um, and new, again, new varieties every year. Um, this one is one that uh, puts out pups. So it's got a, um, it's a Neo Regilia is the variety. And um, it just adds, because of the variegation, you just get, you know, a, a little brighter um, composition, something that looks not completely dull. Um, and I'm gonna futz here for a while. So I don't think we need to see most of the rest of the video, but um, you get your general idea of, of uh, combining lighter with darker and a variety of leaf shapes. And the best thing is the black container. Black really complements, uh, I think complements these colors. So I think we can go on to the next one, Cindy. But before that, Melanie, yeah. people are having a heart attack because I, when I plant uh, uh, plants, and when I take them out of the containers to put them in the ground outside, I always break up the root ball. And oh. yet you didn't break up the root ball. So they're all going, what about the root ball? So what about the root ball? <laughs> the, the anthurium root ball? or The, the one big one, yeah, the anthurium. The anthurium. Yeah. Um, well, you can break it up. Um, and it's probably a step that I did forget to do, to tell you the truth. But um, 
yeah, it, those roots, they will start to generate roots from the up, the where the crown of the plant meets the soil because um, anthuriums are, are epiphytes and they'll send out roots to try and find a way to attach to a branch. So with this guy, it's more the roots that will come out from the top of the root ball mm -hmm. um, that'll find their way. Uh, the lower roots will, because they're in so much soil, um, they really aren't uh, as important as the upper roots, but that doesn't excuse the fact that I didn't tease them out. Um, and if you were to plant this in the ground, you probably would tease them out more than if it were in a container. There's not very much room for this to grow anyway, so it's um, they're going to be contained. <laughs> Okay. Um, be anyway. um, Excellent. That is Excellent. A good point for those that you put in the ground. Okay. And, and then we're uh, going to go to video uh, number two. And so, Jill, if you want to come back up, because I know that this is yours. Now, this video was taken outside. And uh, so it's a little bit shakier, but it still has great information to go along with it. So here's Jill outside. And I'm going to unplug my sound so you can hear it. Hi. Take it away. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is um, kind of go step by step on my strategy on how to put a container together. Um, and we'll start down here. You want to make sure you have drainage in the bottom of your pot. Um, so you're going to have to have, you want to have some drainage holes. And a lot of times, what I'll do with the drainage holes is I will um, I will sit a uh, I'll put some so the soil doesn't come through. I'll put some if you have some landscape fabric or a little bit of mesh screening. We'll put those on top of the holes so that the soil doesn't fall down through. You really, really need to have the holes for the drainage, and you can you can make those holes yourself. Yes. Right? Oh yeah, quick drill. A lot of okay. times you just drill it right through. Now terracotta usually will have its holes already, but a lot of times some of these fancier containers will have holes. Um, I think they're designed just to have a pot sitting down in them. So, uh, you know, hold a drill, we'll drill a hole in those really quickly and, and several around. Um, another strategy I have, especially with terracotta, is you know, with containers, you want to be able to move them around if you want to bring them in or bring them out, especially in the fall um, or early spring when maybe a little early um, or they may not be in the right spots. So you want to be able to have some, uh, be able to move them around. So. My strategy is to don't make the pot too, too heavy. Yes. I used to do this years ago when I worked in retail, when I was doing containers um, for a nursery, we used uh, the styrofoam peanuts. But what I found is if you use those, they, they're great to use in, inside a pot, but when you want to compost the pot, and you dump the pot, you have all these peanuts coming out of the soil and you gotta pick through them. So that works, but it's kind of tedious at the end. So what I've devised is to take some old, nursery pots. If you've got some little pieces of plastic at home, like the old uh, four packs six back from the nursery just come apart. And I throw those in the bottom of the uh, container. I don't know, I'll go maybe, maybe a third or halfway up, depending on how big the container is. I'll just fill it in here. And that'll fill part of the pot up, so you won't have to have a full pot of soil. So that'll help lighten the load somewhat, so you can pick these pots up very easily or semi-easy um, when you're Planting. And of course, uh, the next thing that I would do obviously is put the soil in. Um, what you want to use is a fairly light potting soil. Um, sometimes you'll find some of the potting soils have fertilizer already mixed in, so that's a good thing. Uh, it gives them a little bit of a boost um, until you can get some fertilizer on them, so that's always a good thing. But you want a nice, light, well drained soil mix. Um, so, potting soil. Uh, garden soil I find in bags is too heavy, so make sure it's a potting soil. Um, so that would be the first thing I would look for. So we're going to just, just gonna put this in the pot. We'll fill it in. And we'll fill it in all around the pot. Now you may find that some of these pots, um, you know, you can decide if you need to take a pot out. But I think with annuals, they're, they're fairly shallow rooted, so the problem with filling halfway up with some pots. So go all the way up. I may fill in later with soil. It's right here. Okay. So my strategy when I when I put a container together, I like to see um, different things instead of just one um, 
uh, like all geraniums or like all of one thing. I like to see different textures, different colors, different leaf shapes, some things that don't bloom, some things that do bloom, some things that hang, some more upright. So, and I also decide where maybe I'm going to put this pot, how I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look at it from all sides. So if I'm going to do that, then I would do something maybe tall in the middle, and then the smaller things around them, all the way around. Um, if you're going to look at it from one from the front, let's say from one side, you may want to put your tall things in the back or toward the back. So that's kind of how I, I, I start just kind of figuring out where I want to put them. Um, what I put together today, it might be too many, but it just gives you an idea of some of the things you can put together. It may be that you had a bigger pot. Um, cannons are really popular. Everybody likes to keep a cannon. So, um, and this color, um, this color is just gorgeous. with can I can see too many of this color. Um, we're going to start with that. Now, the pot's not the greatest, it's not the biggest. But we're going to put it in there anyway. Start with that. And we're going to look at this from one, from one side. It's probably going to be too much for this pot, but that's certainly something if you had a bigger pot, you could put a grass with that. I think that would look nice and have the same kind of color. Um, but certainly, this is going to be for, sh for sh the sun, uh, mostly. And also, I always think about color combinations. Like, I like warm colors together, or maybe a pink theme, blue, blue silver theme, blue white theme. Um, this one's going to be a little bit of a bronzy, so I picked this one, this one is. One thing you got to remember is, um, you know, annuals grow quick, quickly and they always benefit by pinching. So I'm always deadheading because they'll grow and they'll, they'll become more floriferous if you pinch. Um, especially with coleus, you tend to get a little stretch. So a lot of times I make the back in here and I just give them a pinch. And my mother used to be horrified because I pinched all the flowers on me. Plants at home. So there, 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 no, there would be no uh, flowers on the plants. But I was always telling her, and this was even as a kid, I knew I knew to do that because I knew that they would get up from that. So it doesn't look like much, but that thing will, will push it out and then it will get all kinds of nice little leaves on it. And it kind of pushy, so I do that a lot with even with the annuals with the flowering thing while they um, I also picked out some of these other coleus, which I think are very neat. So here's another sort of color. Combination, uh, leaf texture difference. So I kind of like that. Put that one in there. Um, I like just foliage plants in with mixed in. And then Melody was saying about the one, the one combination I had, I put parsley in there. You could put basil, you could put some sage in. Um, so I like that kind of stuff mixed in too. We always used to call that fusion word gardening. Certainly, um, it's, it's you can mix all that in together. So I can maybe put another one on this side. And then maybe since we're looking at it from the front, I picked up only a tana, which is more low growing, but it'll hang a lot. So I kind of like to have that in there too. So you have a little bit of a now. Some of these are getting pretty root bound only because they've been in the pot for a while. So, what I like to do sometimes is get in there and um, just pull the roots apart a little bit. Even if they're not in there. Um, what will that help them do? That will help them to grow and root out and find, find um, water. They're stuck in that one root ball, and it's just they're not, gonna, they're not going to get enough water. So, they're probably not going to grow and they're going to suffer, especially. You know, so that's kind of how I put that type of container together. And look at how great the black yeah. shows the color off. Something really kind of different. Yeah, again, it's it's very important to uh, remember the color of your container and that it does not clash with the plants that you choose. Exactly. And, you know, if it's in one of the like piano in there, you could Grass in there has the same color combination, so that's um, another way. And obviously, you could, you could do some other types of plants, but um, that, that'll give you a nice um, 
Set up a picture, so I'll go through and let me do a little pitching right away. And how often do you feed these guys? Um, it depends. If you're, obviously, with this type of heat humidity, humidity here, sitting on a deck or something, it's going to get a lot of heat. Um, and the crop's going to warm up. So I'd say if you're watering it just about every day, start out with some osmocote, some slow release. But as soon as it gets really hot outside, that stuff releases really quickly. So um, I would say, you know, if you want to use a liquid fertilizer, maybe once a week. I like to use it organic, plant tone. That kind of thing, and, and that dissipates pretty quick too. So I would say that you don't have to use quite as often. Maybe give it a shot of that. Mm -hmm. um, sprinkle that maybe once a month. But if you're watering a lot, it takes a lot more fertilizer because it's washing. You know, it's pretty much different. Um, so looks great. Um, and there's one more color combination. I I just went through the green house and we just picked out the louder. I just picked out just a kind of combination for shade. Um, and I like the pinky. And again, I picked five different plants because I like to look at each one. Um, now, this may be not the size pot you want for it, but certainly if I have a flame in here for the height, and I even picked out a New Guinea impatient, it's kind of pinky, and this coleus that I think is really pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, just the leaf, it, and I cut it back a little bit, but the leaf um, texture that is really neat from Travis Gancha, which will hang. But again, um, that can be pinched back, and it does bloom. It's a little pink flower. It's a flower it's pretty pretty. That would definitely be something for in the front of the side. And even this little ajuga, which is a perennial, you can add perennials to your pots, eucalyptus, hostas. And certainly when the season's over, you could take those out and plant them in the ground if you want. Um, but they make nice little potted plants. So that's a little ajuga. So in this combination, which would be your thriller? The thriller, the spiller, and the filler. The thriller, the spiller, and the filler. So the thriller was probably the caladium. Yeah, probably, because I think that has the most bling. And your filler, and your spiller. Yay! There you go. Gorgeous. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Can you? Now we've gone on to the third one. Thank you so much. We have lots of questions with that, Jill. And they all want to know why you use so many plants uh, to, to be able to go along with things. So yeah, I'm not yeah. quite sure what happened. I like instant bling. Hold on. We had a problem. There we go. We had a problem with overflow. OK, good. Go ahead, Jill. Oh, for, okay. Uh, I, I use a lot, a lot of plants. I just like instant bling, so I tend to really fill them fast. And I think that's part of, probably because I did a lot uh, of growing for retail, and we didn't, we wanted to turn over them much quicker. So I, I always go for instant bling. Um, I, I know there was one question about overcrowding. Um, I think if you keep them pinched back and keep them deadheaded, um, I've never really had any really issues with overcrowding only because they're in, in those pots, that container is such a short season. Um, I've never seen really any issues, but there, you do want to do some pinching and maintaining to keep those plants from really getting overgrown. And sometimes plant selection makes a big difference too. So if you know something's a little more um, really floriferous or just over, overpowering, you may want to stay away from those kinds of things. I am going to bring some, I never do this, but we have a guest uh, that I think you want to hear from Jill. So I'm going to open up the mic just to this one guest okay. and let her ask you the question out loud. Go ahead, guest. I think I probably know who it is. Maybe. Barbara. Hmm. Barbara, go ahead. Oh, Barbara. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. She's muted, I think. You've got to unmute yourself. Okay, Welcome Barbara, on you're camera. Set. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> Hello. I just wanted to say how beautiful the uh, combinations are. Oh, thank I love you. them. Thank you. That's Melanie, too. Melanie did a lot of it, too. So thank really you. Really great. Great ideas. <laughs> There's one more video. 
Hope yep. you're all for those well. of you that don't know, Barbara is our retired director, so I had to have a little impact because if she's watching, Jill and Melanie better keep their selves in line. <laughs> so, but let's go on to the third uh, video. Thriller is climbing up a bamboo stake. There are also a couple other ways you can incorporate some structures in your container to allow climbing plants to climb. Here are two examples um, that can be used and eventually this guy very vigorous grower is going to need somewhere else to grow besides up this pole. So it probably would have been better if we had incorporated something like I just showed you. But for now, this is what we get. And uh, another thing we wanted to show you, Jill is going to show you the proper way to keep your containers looking good throughout the growing season because flowers unfortunately don't last forever. Um, and we need to keep them looking good and healthy. Jill, would you like to explain? Yeah, what I mean is, you know, you're going to have to do some maintenance to these. And, and, and deadheading, uh, pinching back is really important. The chewing is uh, geranium, obviously, going to need to deadhead. Even trimming back the potato vine is going to get old. It's going to go everywhere. So they love to be trimmed, especially herbs and things like that, like to be trimmed, like to be used. So periodically, I'll take an animal pincher. I'll go through, and I, I'm not crazy about foliar flowers. So I'll go through and I'll just show me the flower. So this we can is, some see people what you're like that. About. Some people don't. I don't. I like the foliage more than the flower. So I think I would rather look at the foliage. Agreed. But it starts to get a little leggy. I'm going to start pinching it back just a little bit and pinch the little centers out. It will push out and it will be fresh. Um, it will take very long for an annual like that to. to Oh, well, look at that color combination, the purple and the blue right yeah. there. Oh, the Angelonia. Stunning. One of the neatest, neatest blue flowers is the Volvulus. Oh it's my God. One of the truest blue. Very few uh, flowers have, annuals have true blue. You usually didn't see purples or lavenders. Gorgeous. Volvulus is one of the truest blues. Um, nice combo. Um, you know, drain is always going to be deadheaded. I just deadheaded this one the other day. Um, so that's pretty much done. Even and can you show us where you would cut it off? Yeah, with the drains, a lot of people tend to just, we'll just take it off here at the top, and then you have this ugly stem that's going to turn brown. I usually go all the way down to it hits the main stem and give it a little snap. And it snaps off pretty easily. It snaps easily. right off. It's just a little pair of cleaners. Um, obviously, you know, sometimes the parsley, that you would want to use. So I might come out and give that a little nip and put that in something I'm cooking. Um, but I'm looking for yellow leaves, um, obviously. And even this uh, little Dumfrina is starting to look a little tired. What is the name of that again? Dumfrina. Okay. Seeing a little Dumfrina there. Oh, it's very pretty. And then here's another Angelonia. It's very pretty. That's one of my favorites, I think, out of all the annuals right now. Just, there's so many Angelonia colors. And this is the Angelonia, colors. right? This little guy right here. Right there. This is the Dumfrina. Now, is the Dumfrina a butterfly? Yeah. The plant butterflies like that one, too. A little tired, so I'd get through and pinch. Like I said, I used to pinch when I lived in Hong Kong. That at me because I'd pinch all the flowers off. Look at you teaching your mother. <laughs> and then, obviously, I'm going to train this one around. This the potato vine is very vigorous. Wow. So I may go through and just, I need my scissors, but I may go through and just cut that off um, because it's just, it's very vigorous. So I would cut that off right there and let that move back down. Wow, that's gorgeous. And the name of this guy right here? That's a Travis Scan. Travis Scan. Yep, it's another type of Travis Scan. And that stays pretty well behaved. Yeah, that's going to stay pretty neat. And that's one that maybe at the end of this year you might bring in. It's a house plant, basically. Travis Scan is a house plant, like the purple one that I planted. And this orange one, what is that? Cassandra. Cassandra. Right. And that one is a little deadheading. I'm not even. Glossy leaf here is complemented 
by the glossy leaf of the chrysanthemum. It's nice to, to continue certain themes throughout your composition. All right, anything else for now? All right. Okay. I am trying to get back plugged in here so that you can see me. And I would like to ask some questions to the speakers and see if we can answer some of these before we have to go for the day. But thank you very much, Melanie and Jill, for those lovely videos and for your advice. I think we're gonna to have to hit you up afterwards because people really wanna know what was in the containers, what plants did you use? And um, we will be glad to share that in the question and answer uh, uh, resource page that we put on our website. So we'll get that together for everyone and we will share those plant names with them. So I'm looking now to be able to see uh, some of the questions that people are asking and have you and, and Melanie answer them, Jill, if that's possible. So can you recommend a trailing plant that tolerates sun? Um, there's, there's quite a few. I mean, of course the potato vine will take sun. Um, Lantanas that will trail, that will bloom for you. Potato vine blooms, um, but that has nice foliage. Procopus. Procopus. Um, there's what we call fan flower. Scovola is a wonderful trailer. Some of the calipercoas will, 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 will trail. Uh, petunias, obviously, are very nice for trailing. So there's a lot of, lot of things for sun that you can use. Um, uh, let me see off the top of my head if there's anything else. Some vinca vines, mm -hmm. ivies, things like that that you can use just for color that won't be blooming, but um, certainly you can use those for so, just something different. Some uh, vines, the trail, um, or you can put those up a trellis, but they'll hang around the sides. Um, what else? Uh, Lismachias, wonderful little plant that you can put on, on the edges that will just hang over and fill in. Oh, those are wonderful. Um, yeah, gosh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of little things you can do. Yeah, but those are the main ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, terrific. That's great. Yeah, because it is important to have something come down uh, and give full interest. Although I notice you don't do it on all containers, so maybe some of the more fo formal containers you do not add right. the spillers. You know, dichondra. If anybody's familiar with the dichondra with the silvery leaf, that certainly is a really neat. Uh, interesting plant to put down on, the, on around those sides that will hang and just just do really well there too so that's a sunny can be sun and some of those plants that are trailing that don't bloom can obviously take some shade too so there's some options there but um uh so those are the ones off the top of my head that we, we grow here a lot and the common ones you see around okay terrific do you have to have holes in a pot drain holes or can you somehow get around uh not putting drain holes in so that uh, the water is contained. How, how would you treat a container if you can't put a hole in it? What would you do to make sure it doesn't rot, the plant doesn't rot? Well, that's, um, that's what we uh, deal with in the interiors all the time. And um, you have to definitely control the amount of water that you use and probably put them in an area that's protected from rainfall um, under an eave or against the side of your house. Um, and you just know that you water the same amount every time. Uh, you have a schedule that you follow and uh, monitor the level of moisture in the soil, um, you know, on, religiously, because they, they will definitely, there is a fine line between enough water and too much. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's really true. I think you also made, you both made people faint at how many plants you put in a container. So what is the rule of thumb? How do you know how many to put in? And then how do you, what, what special do you do to this container that's so lush from the very beginning? Gosh, I, I, for, for me, um, I, I just start putting plants in. in. I, I really don't even have a strategy. She can't be stopped. <laughs> um, I just I just look at what I've got and look at heights and look at and just have a combination and you know I, I don't even look at, 
at the size of the pot so much is I just start putting plants together. Okay. I kind of know when to stop because I know when it's getting to be too full. But for someone who doesn't know when to stop. Yeah, I you... mean, I mean, you can overdo it. Um, I would say on a normal, you know, pot that you're going to put on top of the deck, you know, maybe a, 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 what, a 15, 14 inch pot, you might put four or five plants in. I do odd numbers. I mean, a lot of planters do odd numbers of everything. Um, so that's kind of me too. Yeah. So I'll do an odd number of plants, whether that I, instead of four, I'll do five. Mm -hmm. I do seven. I'll put one in the center or a couple off the side and then I fill in. So I usually do, I go with the odd numbers. So start out with, you know, say five plants and mm -hmm. see if maybe if you need two more. Uh, I, I, obviously you're going to just, you're going to know when it's just time to stop too. Um, because those plants are going to grow so fast, but then there, there again, you need to take heat and, 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 and pinch and, and deadhead and then help that too, because you don't want to do too many or you're going to get a lot of yellow leaves. You're going to get some that just aren't going to make it. Um, yep. I'm going to overpower others. Um, but for me, I, I, I it's hard yeah, to say. And it's just, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a, an ever changing palette too, meaning that if you have success with something this year, make sure you use it next year. Uh, it's a, right. constantly learning from year to year what works, what doesn't work. Um, and uh, you can pull them out too. If they're too, you can pull them out if it, they get too crowded and you can always add to it if it's not enough. Yeah. Melanie, we can't see your face when you're talking. And, and audience, I hope you realize that we're trying very hard to social distance at the same time as we're uh, showing both of them. So I thank you both for doing the best job that, you're, that you can. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things that you need to explain to people, if your container is that full, all the, all the plants you put in that container really should be of equal watering conditions and equal fertilizing conditions. You don't have to fertilize more. Jill, you always do an excellent job of pruning out, pruning out, pruning out. And that's something that you have to do when it's that full to begin with. And then eventually it does poop out at the end of the season. So realize that the staff at the Smithsonian isn't just planting one time a year. They're planting multiple times during the year for those uh, containers. And I know we have a spot in the greenhouse that those containers come back and rest uh, for a while and get rejuvenated and then eventually go back out again if it's a tropical plant. So it's something to consider. It's the trick behind the screen that they are doing a lot more than you think that they are doing. So for you at home, it's very good advice. Put a lot of plants in, but make sure they're all the same watering conditions, all the same environmental conditions. Uh, put the plants in full, but then you're going to have to fertilize and you are going to have to water the heck out of things. Uh, so if you don't want to do that, be conservative when you're putting the plants in uh, and doing that. There was just a great, oh, I know, the last question, because we're getting towards the end of the video, is do you reuse the soil uh, from year to year that you're putting in your containers? Okay, so yes, they're both shaking their heads. They do reuse the soil. I know they refresh that soil when they're putting it back in because they'll add compost to it or they'll add a little bit more. So when you're at home, the idea is, yes, you can reuse the plant, the soil that you've had in previous containers, but don't do it if your plants are diseased because those, those diseases are gonna go down into the soil. They may go down in the soil and refresh them with some type of compost or something because uh, the, the, the soil, by, that's why it's not even called soil. It's called a medium, a planting medium. That's where the roots are getting. You're adding the fertilizer to it. So it's almost like you're planting things in sponges and then adding stuff to it so that they grow. But it is at the end of our, our presentation and there are so many more questions that are on it. We will do our very best to answer all the questions and put them up and that's the beauty of this so that people can see uh, the parts that, uh, uh, or the, the answers to the questions that they weren't able to see during the uh, webinar itself. But Jill and Melanie, I want to thank you so much for that. That was the first time we ever showed any videos, and I know we were all sweating a little bit, but uh, thank you for doing what you did, and thank you for allowing us to come inside the greenhouse and see things that we normally wouldn't see. So thanks to everyone. Hope to see you next week. We're going to do foliage plants in the garden. Uh, so we'll see you next week. 
Thanks for everyone for attending. Bye-bye now. <laughs>